Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawm al-deen Allahumma ja'alna minhum ameen Everyone say ameen We always begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We always begin by thanking him for the blessings that we are just completely unaware of You know the word alhamdulillah is so remarkable because it makes up for our forgetfulness because we say Alhamdulillah and it's a word that is so comprehensive that you are not the one who is responsible to remember every single thing that Allah has given you because that's quite frankly impossible. So we always begin by saying Alhamdulillah. This session is probably going to be the one that I am most passionate about. It's because my wife and I Alhamdulillah had our first child 11 weeks ago today. Alhamdulillah, baby Musa, who I miss a lot. Um, and the weight and the responsibility and the reality of these sessions, talking about building a family and refining the relationship between parent and child, to me before these 11 weeks has always been theory. And I've studied it and I lived it, I grew up a child to parents, so I understood it from certain capacities. But as with everything in life, the more experience you gain, the more wisdom you gain, and the, 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 the more mature your knowledge becomes. And so now that I sit here, a young father, able to look into the face and the eyes of my son, all of these topics about how to have a relationship with your child in a way that preserves their iman, their relationship with Allah and their relationship with you, all these topics have become a lot more heavy. And I ask all of you to make dua for my son and my wife, inshallah. But I wanted to give a couple pointers and mostly to the parents. And I can talk to the, the youngsters, inshallah, towards the end. But in this lecture alone, References to Luqman Hakim radiallahu an, someone who is a lighthouse. He's a bastion of guidance for us in the Quran about parenting and the relationship between parent and child. References to Luqman have been made numerous times. And whenever someone references Luqman, it's always in the construct of trying to tell children Look, listen, this is what Allah is telling us through the Qur'an about how you have to be with us. I just did a, a family night session in my community in Dallas, Texas about actually this chapter, this passage from Surah Luqman where he's advising his son. And you should have seen miraculously all of these parents with their teenagers ma magically showed up, the ones who never show up. And they made all their teenagers sit front row. And every time I mentioned something about respecting parents, they would look at their child and just nod their head slowly. Right? And kind of, yes, exactly. But what's interesting, and I'm going to be very honest with you, is that as I was researching the topic, as I was reading the different tafasir and different explanations and different understandings, there is something that we skip. There is something that we gloss over, we quickly mention it, and then we go to all of what we consider to be the good stuff, the meat and potatoes. And that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions two very interesting characteristics, not about how Luqman's son should be with his parents, but he mentions two characteristics about how Luqman approached his son. So he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us two phrases. The first is he says, and remember when Luqman said to his son, وَهُوَ يُعِذُهُ And he was, and the translation is kind of bad, but it's, and he was admonishing him, he was reminding him, he was preaching to him. If you look up the word wa'id, wa'adha, in the Arabic language, it has the meaning not of preaching, 
but of being so concerned out of love for somebody's goodness and their safety and their well-being that your love sort of spills over out of your heart and into your tongue. Like your love is so, you can't contain it, that your love is so strong that you just have to say something. Notice here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't tell us that Luqman went to his son and he was angry at him, he was disappointed in him, he was trying to rectify him. No, he says that he went to him and he went to him in this state of such love that his love was unable to be contained and then he spoke to his son and these words were filled with love so much so that instead of saying Ya Ibni, which as growing up as an Egyptian, Ya Ibni means you're in trouble, right? You get Habibi and you get Ibni. Ibni means you're going to get in trouble. Habibi means inshallah you're going to get some halal rice crispy treats, right? Or something nice, okay? And instead of saying Ya Ibni, which is the literal translation for my son, he says Ya Bunayya. Ya Bunayya. Ya Bunayya in the Arabic language, it also means my son. But why choose Ya Bunayya over Ya Ibni? Because Ya Bunay has the meaning of love and adoration built into it. So before we talk about all of the advices that Luqman gave to his son, radiallahu anhu, before we tell our children, look, read this chapter, tell me what you've learned. We need to ask ourselves as parents, and I can say that now, alhamdulillah. How many of us, when we approach our children to remind them, we do it, number one, in the same way that Luqman did, where his heart was filled with love, and number two, where that love was so strong that our words became super soft and easily receivable. Ask yourself, honestly, the last time that you critiqued your child, that you tried to change their behavior, that you tried to remind them of something that was good for them, and I'm not doubting that you want good for them. Every parent wants good for their children, and this is something that children need to understand. That your parents are not trying to make your life horrible. You know, one time I said that in the halaqa, I said, you know, I said teens, I was talking to my teenagers, I said, your parents don't hate you. And one girl goes, really? I said, y yes, your parents don't hate you. She goes, prove it. I said, well, you're here right now. You know how difficult it is to get you from here to here? You know how many diapers there are from here to here? I said, your parents love you. But the fact that she had to challenge that notion shows me something. That sometimes the love that we have gets lost on the way from our heart to our tongue and it ends up coming out instead of roses like daggers. And the words that we use, they stick and they make young people feel irrelevant. They make them feel not worthy. They make them feel not sufficient, not good enough. I once had a young child who said to me, you know, subhanAllah, if I ever get like a 98 or a 99%, all of my other friends, their parents hug them and compliment them. My dad says, where did the other 1% go? And you're laughing now, but how many of you are like, yes, where did it go, right? You're asking, like you're sympathizing with the dad. The reality is that these words, we think that they're small and we move on. We quickly forget them because the tomato gauche is cooking. We have to go make sure it's done right. But the kids remember this, not for minutes, not for days or weeks or months, but for years. And it changes them for their eternity, for their lifetime, and the cycle repeats itself. So we're going to talk about how to raise amazing young Muslim children. We have to understand something, that the plant is only as healthy as the soil that it came from. That if you look at your child, and this is Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah, he's so powerful when he talks about communal change or family change or any kind of change. He always says, go and look at the mirror. Go and look at yourself. You see your child being a certain way. Ask yourself, what am I doing and how can I change this in myself? You know, the topic that was given to me, the subtopic, was addressing our children whenever they say the phrase, I'm bored. 
Any parents in here, your children have ever said that to you, I'm bored? Anybody? Raise your hand if your children have ever been bored. Wow, mashallah, you are boring people. No, I'm joking. <laughs> so I wanted to speak a little bit more broadly because I think that this is, saying I'm bored is more of a symptom. It's not the disease, right? It's like if you went to the doctor and you're like, you know, he, the doctor says to you, hey, you have the flu. You're like, yeah, yeah, just take care of this runny nose. And the doctor says, no, 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 we have to take care of the disease, not the symptom. And you're like, no, 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 just the runny nose. I'll be fine, thank you. That's not how we work. If your children ever feel bored or they ever feel, let's say, disconnected, we have to first understand something very, very important. And that is, mashallah, may Allah reward her, Dr. Susie Ismail, who is a pioneer, mashallah, for women's education and women's empowerment in the community for as long as I can remember coming to these conferences, she mentioned something very, very beautiful, and that is that every generation is going to have that tension with the older generation. Every single generation. I'll be honest with you. When I was younger, when I was younger, I used to have that tension, and I always said to myself, I said, Abdurrahman, you're never going to have this sort of disconnect with your children or with youth. You're always going to be up to date. You're always going to know everything. And then Snapchat came out, and I was like, what is happening? <laughs> or I go to my halaqat, and the kids are telling me about Lil Yadi and Drake's new album. And I'm like, who is Lil Yadi? And I have no idea what's going on. And I just look and nod and say, yes, have some more Krispy Kremes, right? Like, I don't know what to do. So I'm experiencing that disconnect as well. But I'll tell you something that's amazing. Dr. Susie mentioned a couple of really awesome points, like, picking up on the language, understanding what they're saying. But I'll tell you something that's really, really gonna empower everybody in this room. You know what connects people better than language? You know what will connect you with your children better than the ability to say, wow, mashallah, daughter, your hijab is on fleek today, right? Or son, mashallah, your beard is lit, right? Instead of saying those things to connect to your children, you know what connects universally across time? across place, doesn't matter where you live, what you are, smiling. When you smile at your children, the Prophet Muhammad was described by many companions, but in particular, the young ones, as we never saw him except that he was smiling. Now I want you to think for a second. When you read the hadith literature, you and I both know that there were times when the Prophet ﷺ was not smiling. We know this for a fact. There were times we know where he was crying. There are times we know where his face was very serious. There are times we know where he was even frustrated a little bit. So we know that the Prophet ﷺ was not always smiling. So how is it the case then that so many people can come and say that this man ﷺ always smiles. It is because that is his default. That is his asl. If I were to ask your children today, what is your parents' default face? What face do you think they would make to me? You tell me. And by the way, we use this even in the English language. Some people spend so much time at the library, we say things like, man, it's like you live there. You live at the library. People spend so much time at the gym. Do you sleep at the gym too? We use levels of hyperbole to communicate what is a person's default, what is their norm, what are they always doing? And so the Prophet Muhammad did not in fact always smile, but he was smiling so constantly that when people thought back to their memories about him, والسلام, they could not remember a face other than one that was smiling. This is a challenge that we have to live to. That when we think of our parents, I want every parent in this room, make this your goal. And I know that this is gonna get a little bit heavy, but at your janazah, at your janazah, you want your children shedding tears, remembering your face as one that's smiling. At my janazah, I want my child to remember me as a father who smiled. Not one who had his finger like this and a brow that was furrowed and lips that were pursed making him feel insufficient as a son. 
That's not going to produce anything that we want in this life or in the next. So the Prophet Muhammad was someone that was always in a state, a mood that was good. And you know the difference when you show up to work or show up at home and your co-workers or your boss or your spouse, when they're in a good mood versus a bad mood, you know how that makes you feel. So try to apply that to yourself. The second thing that the Prophet Muhammad did that connected him, where he was always relevant with young people. And by the way, we're talking about a father who was in his 40s and 50s. You know, a lot of you are thinking, oh yeah, you know, you young fathers and young mothers, you guys are all, mashallah, connected, but it's tough when you're old. He was older, alayhi salatu salam. You know, there's a beautiful story of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and many of you have heard it, but I want to tell it to you with a specific lens. Where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, one of the younger companions, you know, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, they, they had a kunya for him, the younger companions, because he didn't have a child, he had a bird. You know, normally when someone has a child, they earn a kunya. In the Arabic language, it means like a nickname. So for me, my son's name is Musa, so what's my kunya? Abu Musa, very good, right? Thank you for the three people who got it, mashallah. <laughs> so Abu Musa is my kunya. So this young child obviously doesn't have a child of their own. They have a bird. And the bird's name is an nughayr an nughayr and this child's name was Umair. So one time the Prophet Muhammad walked by and noticed that this child was crying. And he said to him, instead of walking by and saying, okay, I have better stuff to do, he said to him, Ya Umair, ma fa'ala nughayr. What happened to your bird? And if you notice, it was like a beautiful little couplet. It was like a rhyming couplet. And the child looked up at the Prophet Muhammad with tears in his eyes. And he said, my bird, an nughayr he passed away, he died. And the Prophet Muhammad at that point could have taken one of two paths. He could have said, Kullu man alayha fan. Everything will die. Worry about your fajr. What's wrong with you? Why are you crying over a bird? There are people there that are dying and starving. He could have made him feel worthless. But what did he do, alayhi salatu salam? He took this young boy and he proverbially put his armor on his shoulder and he actually took the bird and they buried the bird and they gave the bird a burial, like a janazah for a bird. And that made this young boy feel what? Feel like he was worth something to the Prophet Muhammad The question I have for my parents here tonight how interested are you in the things that your children are interested in? How many of you go to your kids' athletic competitions? How many of you go to your children's parent-teacher conferences? How many of you go to your children's anything that they do? How many of you make time to go to those things and make sure that you know what's going on to make them feel like they are worth it? Or how many of us, it's just something that they do and we're not connected? You see, if you want to solve the problem of boredom, you actually have to solve the problem of disconnectedness. That's what causes people to be bored. It's not about young versus old. I've been in a room with lots of people before and become bored because they were talking about Pakistani politics and I have no idea what's going on, right? I became bored because I was disconnected. So what should a person do if they notice that people are bored with them is they should become connected with them. So the Prophet Muhammad sees this boy crying about his pet and instead of saying it's a pet, get over it, he goes to him and he connects with him. This is prophetic parenting and you cannot replace these moments. The last thing I'll say about giving advice, because we're running a little bit short on time, is the third advice that I'll give about how to solve this problem of disconnectedness is you have to actually have a conversation with your child. That's the first step. 
And conversation does not mean you give them an address, that you talk to them. Don't be like President Donald Trump, where he has a press conference and doesn't take questions. Right? You go to your kitchen, you say, this is the menu for dinner, this is what we're having for dessert, thank you very much, and you walk away, right? No. Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, an incredible story, so many lessons from his relationship with his father. And this is really remarkable, by the way. If you look at Ibrahim's relationship with his father, what do you see? You see a son who is trying to talk to his father, who's trying to level with his father. And his father, in return, does not listen to his son. He rejects his son. He rejects his son's ideas as being far-fetched, elementary, childish. Get away from me. I don't want to hear what you have to say. Now, what we don't realize, and this is actually something that happens in counseling. It's called transference. What happens to us, subconsciously, we reproduce that for other people. So I once was counseling a young sister, and she was telling me about how her father will never ever say yes to her ever. Her father always says no. So she said, what can I do? And I said, let me give you some advice, some suggestions. She goes, oh, none of them will work. I said, okay, well listen, hear me out. So I gave her suggestion number one. She goes, no, it's not gonna work. Suggestion number two, no, it's not gonna work. Suggestion number three, haha, LOL, no, it's not gonna work. I said to her, do you see what you're doing to me? She said, what? I said, what did you complain that your father does to you all the time? He always says no. I said, I just gave you three suggestions that you've never tried and you're just saying no. So there is something that happens to us as human beings where we almost have no choice but to redo what we've seen, what we've experienced, unless we understand what happened to us and we change it. So when Ibrahim salam is telling his father, oh my father, don't follow the footsteps of shaitan, his father says to him, get out of here, you don't know what you're talking about. Now fast forward to when Ibrahim has his own son and Allah has told Ibrahim in a dream that you have to sacrifice your son. I have to slaughter you. Then he says to his son something very interesting. And a lot of times we overlook this, right? We jump right to the part where Ismail says, Ya abati if ma tu'mar. Oh my father, do what you've been commanded. We look at our teenage son, we say, why don't you talk to me like Ismail talked to Ibrahim? Worthless but Tamiz child, right? Look at what Ibrahim did first though. See, this is the problem. When you read Quranic narrative, you can't skip parts. You have to read all of it. Ibrahim says to his son, what? فَانْظُرْ مَاذَا tara. Tell me what you think. And he's not saying this like because people are watching and he wants people to think that. He's having a conversation with his son. And he's not yelling or demanding. He's talking to him. He's telling him. And by the way, there is no choice in this situation. If Allah has commanded it, there is no negotiation. There is no altering. There's no plan B. There just is. But he wants his son to know that even though Allah has commanded me to do this thing that I have to do, and I, wa I want you guys to understand something. He didn't know that Allah was going to send an animal as a replacement. Ibrahim did not know that it was all going to end up, quote unquote, okay. He thought that in just a few moments, he was going to have his son sacrificed on the top of a mountain. Imagine, I can't even, I can't even process those words, being a new father myself. It's too painful. And even though he knows that there's no choice in the matter, he turns to his son lovingly and says, فَانْظُرْ مَاذَا tara." I want you to tell me what you think. Literally the word tara means tell me what you see. Give me your perspective. How are you looking at the situation? Even though we can't change it, I want you to know that your thoughts matter to me. And so you might have moments where your children, maybe the situation is unchangeable. 
Maybe it's static. Maybe it is what it is. A lot of times in life, things are what they are. That's it. But that doesn't mean that you can't listen to your children when they talk to you. And not only listen, but ask them, what do you think? Your, your opinions, your thoughts, your ideas, they are like gold and silver to my heart. So let me know what's going on. Brothers and sisters, parenting is probably the most important relationship after a person's relationship with their Lord is their relationship with their children. Because, and that's why Allah Ta'ala says to worship Him alone and then immediately afterwards, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا that being good to your parents. That relationship is so, so important. And part of the reason why is because the relationship that we have with our children will dictate their relationship in their faith with Allah. And so as we gather in this conference today, I, I feel very heavy that I have to communicate to everybody, please, 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 if you've come here this weekend with anything between you and your children, please rectify it, please change it, please fix it. And the last thing I'll leave you with before I conclude as I've gone over my time is be very, very, very careful not to use religion as a way of making your child feel insufficient. Be very careful using religion to critique your child. And don't use religion to be the scapegoat of things that you want your child to do. I'll give you an example. Like young Muslim men, young Muslim teenage boys and men can stay out until Fajr, but young Muslim teenage girls, do you ever notice why girls always have to do brunch with their friends? Because they have to come home before Dhuhr. But the young boys can come home like three days later and we're like, okay, you're alive? Okay, good, alhamdulillah, go shower and clean your room. And what's interesting is that the sisters, the young girls, they come to me and they say, we want to have a lunch, we want to have a dinner, we want to have something at our friend's house. And my parents say no because it's against Islam. But I look at my brother and he's out as long as he wants to be. Is there like a, a gender? Like they say that shaitan comes out at Maghrib, but does shaitan only chase women? That literally, they're like asking these questions and they're not joking, they're being serious. Because when I want to go out at Asr time, my mom says no because shaitan's going to come out. And when my brother wants to go out at Maghrib and lay in the driveway, my mom says go ahead, bismillah. And this is very dangerous to use religion as the, 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 as the mount for which you make your children feel insufficient and disciplined. That's not the way to do it. If you as a parent have a value, have a belief, your culture tells you something, Bismillah, by all means, it's your relationship. But do not use Islam to take the blame off of you or the pressure off of you because that tension with Islam will stay with them for very long. I ask and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us beautiful relationships at home. I ask and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rectify our hearts and to rectify our iman. And I ask and pray to Allah that anyone who has come here this weekend or anywhere who is having challenging struggles with their children or their parents, I ask Allah to shower mercy upon them. And I ask Allah to remove any ill will or grudge between the hearts. And I ask Allah to make our relationship with our children like that of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, with his children, like that of Prophet Ibrahim with his son, and the best of people with the best of families. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Jazakum Allah khairan everybody. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.